Hello, everyone. Uh, very good afternoon. I'm Dr. Kuntil Kantidas, and I welcome you all to the keynote uh, uh, lecture session on uh, day two of this program. Now, we have got two very interesting and uh, very much look forward to lectures coming up in this session. And I have the honor of inviting three of the most uh, accomplished and eminent neurosurgeons of our country to chair this session. We have Dr. J.K. Parthiban. He is the chairman of neurosurgery at KVMC uh, Coimbatore. We have Dr. Sudhir Dubey. Dr. Dubey is the chief of neurosurgery and the director of uh, minimally invasive brain and spine surgery at Medicity uh, Gurgaon. And we have Dr. Manas Pandagrahi. He is the director of neurosurgery at Kim's Hyderabad. I welcome you all to uh, uh, the panelists for this session. Thank you. Now, uh, we'll be going to the first talk. And uh, the first talk would be delivered by uh, someone who doesn't actually require any introduction is no, none other than our very own, uh, you can say the father of Indian spine surgery, Professor P.S. Ramani. It is an absolute honor and privilege for me to be able to introduce him today to the audience. Professor Ramani is a professor emeritus at LTM Medical College Hospital, Sion University of Mumbai. And he's currently working as a chief of neurosurgery in Lilavati Hospital, Mumbai. Professor Ramani had his initial training in India. And upon after completing that, he moved on to uh, UK, where he had his further training in Newcastle. There he developed a keen interest in spine surgery, and he was immensely popular there. And he had an opportunity to, to stay back and work in UK, but such was his, his devotion to come back to his motherland that he came back after getting his spine degree from there, he, and he started work here. Over a period of 50 years, he has, done, he has made tremendous contribution in the field of spine surgery. And he has also been the founding president of Neurological Surgeons, uh, uh, Spine Surgeon Society of India. He has been the past chairman of WFS FNS Spine Committee. And, and he has also been the president of Neurotrauma Society of India. He has also been the founder and past editor-in-chief of the Journal of Spinal Surgery. And he is also the editor-in-chief of the journal Spine. Dr. Ramani has had many accolades in his name. To name a few, he was the first Asian recipient of the Paul Bussey Award from the University of Chicago. And this Paul Bussey is the same Bussey which we name uh, known as the Kluver Bussey syndrome. And he was the founding editor of the journal uh, Surgical Neurology. Dr. Ramani has also been bestowed upon a very prestigious uh, honor in the form of his, his uh, a poster stamp by the government of uh, Hungary. In his honor, uh, Indonesia uh, named one of the operation blocks as Dr. P.S. Ramani Operation Theater. He has been the recipient of a number of awards, including the Saraswat Ratna Puraskar and the Gomant Vibhushan Puraskar. He has been conferred the Lifetime Achievement Award by the Indonesian Neurosurgical Society, as well as the British Spinal Association. In addition to his immense contribution in the field of spine, including thousands of surgeries, numerous publications, numerous books, chapters, Dr. Ramani had had been able to do a lot of philanthropic activities, including his home state of Goa. And there's, in, in his uh, respect and memory, they have named a, a street in his name. And there is a marathon, annual marathon, which goes by the name of, name of Professor Ramani. Mm -hmm. And such is the importance of this individual that we have in front of us today that his birthday, 30th November, is celebrated as the Neurospinal Day in our country. So, sir, it is an absolute honor for us to have you as the keynote speaker. And I request you to kindly start your presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Das, for that introduction. Ladies and gentlemen in the audience, since yesterday, you have been listening and learning all that in spinal surgery that has been offered to you with the painstaking efforts taken by Dr. J. Sardar and his team, very informative. And I'm sure you must have become much more wiser by this program. I personally feel it was a very, very beautiful program. And it starts with, uh, starts with anatomical landmarks and then follow with approaches, etc. Then there were lectures by Dr. Atul Goyal, Dr. Kale, 
then Dr. Sushil Patkar also spoke, Parthiban also spoke. They spoke about strategies, which is very important. And uh, there is a publication by Gautam Javeri, who has also uh, actually talked about complication, but he has got a publication on spinal mats, very important chapter in spinal surgery, where also he has talked about strategies, very beautiful. Strategies, strategies. What does strategy mean? That means you know the topic. You know the prognosis, outcome, everything. What is the management? But when it comes to apply to a given patient, there is a strategy to be worked. And I think I will work more on this strategy in my talk than anything else for you to appreciate it better. Before I go further, I thank Dr. Jesh Sardara for organizing and of course his team in the Department of Neurosurgery at uh, Pijuman in Lucknow for this beautiful program, very informative. Most important is that you have been very, very active in communication. You have left you have spared no time to communicate with the people individually or in groups. And that was one of the beautiful aspect of this conference as far as I'm concerned. Can I have the slides please? Yeah. Before I go, once again, I thank Eshi Pijay Lucknow, Department of Neurosurgery, Dr. Jesh Sardara and his team for inviting me to give this lecture. I am, as you have already know, Professor P.S. Ramani. Notwithstanding my age, what is my age anyway? Most of you know it also. Very soon, I will be completing 83 years and I will be going to 84th year. But I am still as active now as I was earlier, much earlier also. And I work as a senior consultant neurosurgeon at Lilawati Hospital and Research Center in Mumbai. And the title of my talk today is Evidence-Based Wisdom. Now let us have a few words on evidence-based medicine. All of you listening and talking since yesterday year know very well about evidence-based medicine and all the presentation, all the papers, all the chapters that we write or talk has got evidence-based in it. Personally, I had popularized microlumbar discectomy. Microlumbar discectomy as advocated by me has stood the test of time and there is enough evidence base on long-term follow-up to say that it has stood the test of time, outcome is good and it is in accordance with established guidelines. One can handle any pathology in the lumbar spine through this approach. This is the microscope I use. This is microlumbar discectomy. We have talked in the morning, in the sessions here, we talk a lot about facetectomy, how much you should remove, how much you should remove. Somebody said 25, somebody said 45. This is drilling the medial part of the facet. And while we are doing this, my standard teaching to everyone who looks around is that we, it's a very, very difficult to say because you are not exposed to the lateral part of the facet and therefore you don't know how much you are resecting really. But the guideline is that no sooner you find medial surface of the pedicle that is the end of your excision of the facet. You first drill it to make it thin, 
and then I use always Escula 45 degree forward, two millimeter, one millimeter, or three millimeter, depending on the need, to excise that part of the bone which is made very thin. Commands were made in the morning, which where you should start and where should come down, you know. You should always start at the top and come down towards the forearm and later on. And where you can, where you can decompress very well the traversing nerve root, you know. Here the nerve root, you are absolutely in close proximity and therefore, rather than use the, and this is I'm directly going into the foramen, it is better to use ultrasound revolving handle to decompress undercutting of the foramen here and decompress the nerve root. It does not damage at all the nerve root. You can go right outside from here, inside out. This is cutting the ligamentum flare in micro lumbar discectomy. Either you don't remove the ligament, or at the most, you can remove the lateral part about 25% of the ligamentum flower. When it comes to the cutting the disc, you have to you have to cut the annulus. Either it has nucleus has come up or is there but it's not more than 20% that you remove. And under microscope, if the disc is sequestrated, it is shown there, you have to just excise it and decompress the nerve root. Sometimes in our country, particularly, you can find large osteophytes growing from the vertebral bodies like this. They have to be excised because they cause foraminal stenosis. I have got a set of micro osteotomes made specially for me, which I use to osteotomize these osteophytes. The nerve root must be well protected, and once you are protected, there is absolutely no harm in using this osteophyte to excise this overhanging edge of the vertebra. This is, a, this is the part you have to excise to decompress the nerve root very well. At times, you can do the same thing with high-speed drill. Very meticulously, your hand must be absolutely stable lest you damage the nerve root. As I was doing this, one behalf, as you know, and just now it was told you to I have been the president of WFNS Spine Committee for a long period of eight years. I established a lot of programs at the WFNS and we also now establish guidelines for the world to follow. We have established already guidelines for lumbar spine, cervical spine, and more recently one osteoporosis. I'm glad Dr. Parthiban is here as one of the panelists. He's very much involved into this program also. And all these guidelines are published in Neurospine. Pattern of guidelines, the pattern that we have followed, pattern that world follows. How do you decide on the guidelines? Reviewing the literature of the past 10 years or more, the articles reviewed are not necessarily without flaws. 
conducting prospective randomized controlled trials are very, very expensive, one time. And secondly, they are time consuming. It takes a long time before you establish the results. Not possible to apply for spinal surgery with most problems having an element of urgency. On this background, I was intrigued very recently, May 21, just a couple of months back, in neurosurgery, there is an article, quality of literature searches published in leading neurosurgical journals. And it is an article on review of the reviews they have done. What a fantastic idea. And their conclusions are that there is mounting evidence that the search strategies upon which systematic reviews are based, including ourselves, they frequently contain errors. The study demonstrates that the search strategies that we are using now in spinal surgery or neurosurgical system requires improvement. That is where we stand now. So evidence-based medicine in spinal surgery. Now let us talk about the characters like conscious, explicit, judicious, and reasonable use of modern best evidence in making decisions about the care of individual patients. The question is how rational it is so what do you do? Do you follow evidence-based medicine or you follow evidence-based wisdom? Optimal treatment or a cost containment tool that you have to answer very honestly to yourself first and then to the patient. Dilemma, which is more important? a successfully treated patient or religiously following Picot, that the patient intervention, comparison, outcome and time. How safe is the surgeon if the guidelines are not adhered to? And or if a surgeon can give better results working away from the established guidelines? So the role of wisdom comes in. First of all, can we afford RCT in spinal surgery? We have to very honestly answer this question. If not, how do we get the evidence? Is it ethical, valid to form control groups in spinal surgical issues which are relatively urgent, which is more important, clinical and surgical wisdom, or you follow guidelines, mathematical. This is Sir William Hulsler. Even today we follow him, everybody knows him. According to him, the good physician treats the disease the great physician treats the patient who has the disease. Medicine is a science of uncertainty and the art of probability. And very important is the greater the ignorance, greater the dogmatism. Sane Guruji, Maharashtrians all know him. Whatever medical knowledge we possess, whatever surgical art we acquire is meant to make life very beautiful for the patient. And you know Viktor Frankl very well, all of you. He said the spinal surgery should be practiced without falling prey to outside liver. Charles Darwin, 
many of you know him. He's an Englishman, naturalist, geologist, and biologist, best known for his thought on evolution of humans. Average intelligence, he was not very intelligent. And he was in fact dropped out from the medical school. But he was a very successful man with his thoughts. And he said the survival of the fittest is through natural selection. Evidence-based wisdom, and this is Turnbuck's theory of human intelligence. Ability to achieve success in life according to one's personal standards mm -hmm. within one's socio-cultural context. Mm -hmm. It includes analytical, practical, and creative abilities. Personal standards like IQ and education. He need not be a genius with 194 IQ. He can just be average with only 100 IQ, but he must be inquisitive, analytical, creative, rational, and practical. <laughs> Arthur Conan Doyle, no, who does not know Arthur Conan Doyle? He was a genius. You know? He was medical doctor, but he was as famous as a writer and created rational, intuitive, with perfect reasoning. And at fiction, it was a Sherlock Holmes was a fiction. He said he never guessed. If we guess, it is destructive to logical thinking, logical faculty. Through Sherlock Holmes, he correctly pointed out Jack the Ripper in 1889 in London, he was a murderer. He had murdered six people, but the police could not find him. He pointed out through his rational reasoning. Richard Feynman, another genius. He was very average at school, but passionate about physics, became a physicist and was awarded Nobel Prize for his work on quantum electrodynamics in 1965. You all know it very well that in 1986, American Space Shuttle Challenger exploded in the sky. Fenman, he was not connected with the uh, Space Shuttle, but he had, just like Arthur Conan Doyle, he made a tenacious inquiry and he exposed the engineer inside their team. It was his mistake which has caused the shuttle to explode. Was it deliberate? No. Was he not intelligent enough? No, he was. But he was overconfidence. Inflated ego and dogmatism. I know everything. He had overlooked this mistake. This is known as intellectual trap. People sometimes fall into the intellectual trap and create mistakes sometimes serious, such as this. In India, of course, you know, nobody, who does not know Nobel Laureate Raman? One day he wanted to open an office in Bangalore, somewhere he wanted four, doctor, four scientists to work with him. He asked for interviews and they were paid traveling expenses. But Chandrasekhar did not qualify. Before going home, he found that he was left with six rupees extra from the traveling allowance. He went straight to the office, but by then it was closed. He did not know what to do with that six rupees. But he knew that Raman in the morning goes for a walk. So next day morning, he waited there in the garden. And when Raman came, he approached him and told him the everything. Raman thought for a while and called him to his office. He said, you come and see me in the office at 11 o'clock. And when he came, he said, you failed in the interview when you are married, but today you have been selected for your honesty. So one more post was created. Instead of four, he appointed five. He worked with him, Chandrasekhar, for a few years, they moved to America. He became a scientist. And in 1984, he was awarded Nobel Prize at a time when other four boys were nowhere. 
Curiosity is the key of wisdom. Curiosity is common with high achievers, even with average intelligence. As a doctor, now I know that curiosity activates neurotransmitter dopamine in the prefrontal cortex. It also transmits the information to hippocampus, causing long-term storage memory. You all know this. No? So in general intelligence, which includes education, curiosity, and consciousness, are the pillars of academic success. General intelligence, it includes, as I said, education, analysis, curiosity, and consciousness. Lessons to the spinal surgeons. Seek new information all the time. Look out for new things and our experiences. Embrace difficult and complicated events rather than just following routine things. Lessons to the spinal surgeon, explore your own problems. Many times, after all, spinal surgeons are their human beings. They are what personal problem, personality problem. You must explore them and sort them out. Explore different perspectives, imagine alternate outcome. Identify erroneous arguments. Intellectual humility, very important, can make us see in the bias blind spot. Very important. Don't be arrogant. Form more rational options. Avoid misinformation. Learn effectively and work more productively. World healthcare system has progressed significantly with technological boom, but World Economic Forum has identified two things which are detrimental to a rapid and meaningful growth. Number one, increasing polarization of people. When I was a resident, oh my God, we work all together in Nizan. Today, even residents are not looking at each other. That is called polarization. Spread of misinformation is digital wildfire. It is everywhere, everywhere. And you must be very cautious when somebody tells you something, when you read something, is it true or is it a misinformation? Dedicated medical profession of the past. When I was a resident at Nair Hospital in medical school, I was taught among other teachers by one physician clinical called Dr. D.D. Bang, who purely by percussion and auscultation could draw with pencil a tuberculous cavity in the chest. Today, the world has changed and knowledge is at the doorstep through net. Even patients today know about their illness by browsing through Google. So what is the doctor's responsibility today? Spare a few moments to listen to the patient intently. Most of the times, that conversation conveys correct impression of diagnosis, pathology, and expected management. Examine the patient very carefully. If you examine the patient very carefully, and this is the time, everyone should make a working diagnosis. Many times with dedicated doctors, it almost proves to be correct. If that is correct, then do only those investigations which are absolutely necessary. Prognosis, never speak in a very negative language to the patient. Always speak with hope, optimism, and empathy. You never know. Today, we all know it is general knowledge that many diseases, when I was a student resident, we learned we did not know anything. They are decoded by the genes today. Example, burning examples is Alzheimer's disease, 
and neurofibromatosis. Doctor should be conversant, should talk to the patient. They should be observant. Do not contradict the patient. Rational thinking, rational medicine, analyze the misconceptions. A wise doctor strives to know more, keeps good records, learns from mistakes. Because wisdom comes from knowledge, and knowledge comes from experience, and experience comes from mistakes. If you understand this, then it is you are wise. So, evidence based medicine. It has been observed just now that research strategy used in neurosurgery team requires improvement. As an evidence-based wisdom, general intelligence includes education, curiosity, analysis, creativity, and consciousness. Today's necessity is that practice spinal surgery combining evidence-based medicine and evidence-based wisdom. Most important, when you approach to the patient, it is you are one-to-one -one with the patient. Then your evidence-based medicine does not become much helpful to you then. Neurospinal surgery is a profession that challenges the doctor to be all the best. We never seem to reach the end of our career while treating patients and start living with them. The wisdom we gain teaches us the meaning of life. Ladies and gentlemen, very thank you for your patient hearing. September 17 to 19, we are having 2021 annual conference the NSSA. It is a virtual this year also. Dr. P.K. Sawi is from Bhubaneswar is the organizing secretary. Please join in large numbers. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you for a very lucid and thought provoking lecture. I'm sure our audience have learned a different aspect of neurospinal surgery through your lecture. And the overwhelming message of your lecture has been that we should try for our technical excellence. We should try for our technical mastery, but at the same time, we need to remain grounded. We need to be wise at the same time, and we need to remain patient oriented. Sometimes we tend to be disease oriented, technique oriented. Many a times as surgeons, perhaps this is our curse, but what you have so clearly pointed out that we really need to uh, be wise while we are increasing our technical mastery. We need to remain honest. We should have an attitude to learn throughout our uh, practice. Uh, at the same time, we are acquiring uh, our skills and we need to remain wise. And uh, the overwhelming message uh, for the audience here that uh, skills are important, but at the same time, you need to remain grounded, you need to remain wise, and you need to learn from your mistakes and move ahead. So at this point, before I move on to the next lecture, uh, I would like to request our panelist, Dr. Parthiban, to uh, make a comment uh, on a beautiful lecture uh, by Professor Raman. Dr. Parthiban. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, can you see my video? Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, it, it is always nice uh, to see Professor Ramani, who has uh, made us uh, neurosurgeons to neurospine surgeons. And now the journey is uh, nearly 30 years. Um, as a young student, uh, after passing, and uh, I had my first training under him in 1991. Now this is uh, 2021, that is 30 years, and the journey is continuing. The wisdom he has now deliberated in this lecture is what was driving and what is driving us. In fact, even today, we work very hard for the Neurospinal Surgeon Association to get it as one of the best in our country. The talk has made one important point 
which came through during uh, our WFN spine committee recommendations placement because I am one of the member of that. Particularly, I would like to mention this. The literature, whatever we read in the literature, has to be scrutinized. It is very difficult to blindly accept that. One point is that we have made a few changes in the recommendations of cervical spondylolytic myelopathy. If we go through the recommendations, whatever said in the earlier days uh, by the Frillings group as the last, we have slightly changed that in our recommendations, if you all of you can go through that. Why I like to mention this is, as in his lecture he made on clear point, the literature has to be, there is some uh, limitations are there and they have to be go through carefully before we accept them blindly. Now, when we have this type of uh, consensus meeting, like what we do through WFNS and NSSDA, we realized it is not only in one particular uh, group of disorder, it is also from various disorders in spine surgery need to be reanalyzed. Because as I said that we need to go forward. We need to go forward with new techniques, but at the same time, very carefully, our wisdom will tell there is something new. It is a wonderful lecture, as always, and we are always there to listen. Even though Sir is now 83, he'll be there for many, many years to come and will guide us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Parthivan, for very lucid comments. And we once again thank Professor Ramani for his talk. Uh, you know, it has been really uh, a very special talk. Thank you, sir.